Hello, everyone, and welcome to Webinar Talks. Today, we have a pleasure to have with us the winner of Ibnoi Technology Award 2023, Dr. Beatrice Conde Petit. Welcome, Beatrice. Thank you, Pedro. I'm very happy to be here with you. Yes, it's a great pleasure to have you, you here with us and also to meet you in Graz in our conference in September. So we are very eager to hear your views about uh, technology because you work in a very relevant uh, in a very relevant field eh? so uh, it's very interesting to see the path of your career that you you have been heading in analytical labs and dealing with the complexity of characterizations in food and food materials then you have been food safety uh, safety officer uh, food size officer and uh, more recently you are a sustainability officer of a, of a large company in, in Switzerland, right? So my first insight when I see your 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 career is that, is that I would like to, to 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 talk to you is how do you see the evolution of the food industry in the latest uh, two, two two decades? Because you you are working in topics that are of extremely relevant. I mean, safety is very relevant, right? Uh, analysis and labeling and so on. So how do you see this? evolution from past to now. Yeah, so Pedro, I've been, uh, I've had the privilege to follow the food industry, you know, along my whole uh, career. First uh, in academia, like from the research and lecturing side, but also working with the industry and then also moving obviously to the private sector, uh, to the company Bühler, which is a technology provider serving food industry around the world. And um, yeah, I could see trends and, uh, and big transformations, but probably the biggest transformation comes from just the fact that we have a massive increase of population in the world. If we think just the last 20, 23 years, the population grew from 6 billion people to 8 billion people on this planet, that's, that's almost one third more. And uh, the industry was able obviously to serve this growing population. And at the same time, we have huge challenges with our food system. I think today we recognize really that more than uh, one fourth of the greenhouse gases come uh, come from the food sector. You know, one third of the energy, seventy percent of the fresh water, and still we have the massive uh, um, losses and waste. Uh, almost one third that we have in the food chain, and. Also on the on the on the side of consumers, there are changes. We have today much more out of house consumption. You have snacking along the day, and that has also changed. Obviously, the the offering on the market. So convenience is a is a very important aspect. That as a consumer, you take it for granted that you know the food is safe. And uh, I think today we can rely, I mean, at least in, in most places of this world, on, on, on safe food. But what you need to do in the background for this is quite challenging and has also uh, challenged the, the food industry. So we, you could also say that more and more, you know, over the last decades, the responsibility for food safety has been delegated from the household as we cook less from scratch to the food industry. So that means that in the food industry had to embrace really all these preventive measures. And that starts really from embracing hygienic design, but also implementing microbial inactivation steps, dealing also with a new re regulation around allergens, which has been very challenging, you know, how to clean and make sure that you don't have cross contaminations, but also dealing with challenges that fortunately consumers don't see or know because the food obviously needs to be safe is the problem that we still have of mycotoxin contamination of cereals which is which is not going away and just to give you an example that that um i i was able to live is uh, that when especially in the us it was found that salmonellosis uh, you know an infection with salmonella uh, can not only occur through the, you know, the animal-based foods, you know, meat or eggs or, or, or shrimps, 
It can also come with uh, low water activity foods, dry foods, <laughs> chocolate, almonds, spices. So that was a big challenge for the food industry. All of a sudden they had to, to get ready on how to deal you know, with the safety. And for instance, in the US, uh, uh, there's a legal requirement to pasteurize almonds uh, for direct consumption. Also flour is more used in, 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 uh, in ready to cook um, preparations where you want to make sure that potential microorganisms are inactivated. So in some cases we have pasteurization of flour. So these processes had to be implemented and you need to deal obviously with the whole uh, process and you, ho you have to understand always the whole value chain. Yes, that's important. There is understanding of the whole value chain, but I also, uh, uh, I would like to understand that this for safety issues, uh, what are the actually the the points or the on the value chain that he's had this has to be monitored in yeah. a point of view? Is this uh, there on the farm level? Is it on the packaging level? Is it on the supplier level? Is it? I mean, how we can we be sure that when we are buying some cereal or a product home? this is actually safe to, to our family. Yeah, maybe I can take the, the topic of mycotoxins to illustrate this. So mycotoxins are toxic compounds which are produced by mold. And this mold can, under you know, certain circumstances, circumstances, grow on the raw material already on the field. Especially if you have humid conditions, if you have, for instance, wet conditions, too much rain before harvest. And this happens for all cereals, but also for other crops like nuts or, or, or fruit. So obviously it is very important already to, to control the agricultural conditions, to understand the risk. And you can take measures very early on how you treat the soil, on, on which seed you select, on what type of uh, plant protection you do, but also monitoring the level of potential contamination already very early. And then when you harvest, um, it's important, the most important thing is to keep then the grain safe, to store it properly. Uh, if you store it under conditions which are too humid, it will uh, these mycotoxins uh, will be produced during the storage. So again, monitoring storage and making sure that this is safe. And also during transport, if you think during the long uh, sh shipping times, things can occur. So at every stage, every player has to make sure that they understand the risk and they have to have the right control and monitoring methods in place. Um, today, obviously, you can do uh, mycotoxin testing. There are analytical tools to do it, and there is a rapid test or standard uh, chromatographic test that you can do in the laboratory. The big challenge is typically the sampling, huh? because um, this contamination is very often not homogeneous. So you really need to understand also sampling procedure so that you understand that, that you make sure that you can really have a good assessment of the risk. Uh, in terms of applying it for food, also in, in, in Europe, we have strict regulations, so we cannot let in raw material into the factories above a certain level of contamination. In other places, like the US, for instance, you have to make sure that in this processing, your final ingredient you know, meets the, the, the compliance levels. And overall, during, you have to make sure that you eliminate the contaminated fractions from this raw material and you know, potentially the ingredient. At the ingredient stage, it's much more difficult before it really enters the food chain. Because there's no way of inactivating this component, for instance, by, by cooking. So it's, it's about identifying it and eliminating it. And already grain cleaning operations, mechanical cleaning, optical sorting are key to guarantee the quality of, of raw material. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think that we will in, in future also under, focus much, much more on the upstream processing of raw materials, because that is the make or break of the safety, in fact, of these raw materials, then also for food processing. 
Yes, so you, you work for uh, Burler, eh? the company in, in, in Switzerland. I mean, of course, you are here as Beatrice, so it's your opinion here. You are here as a, as a person, as an ORD, right? So, but I'm curious about, uh, it's the company you are working, offering technologies. I understood it's one of the biggest technology suppliers for the food industry worldwide, right? Yes. Buehler is serving uh, the food industry, also the advanced materials industry, but mainly food industry. And typically uh, in, in grain processing, wheat, maize, rice, but also pulses, um, oil seeds, uh, coffee, cocoa, covers a broad range of the, of the value chain. So Buehler offers solutions and it also the monitoring and the service that you need to make sure that you also apply these technology solutions in a proper in a proper way. So it starts with grain storage. Today, this, the meaning of a silo in times of, uh, of rising raw material prices and rising potential con contaminations has a completely other meaning. But then also the whole milling or you know, the whole transformation from a raw agriculture, raw material into a food ingredient. In that sense, supporting millers around the world is a very important um, purpose of, uh, of Bühler implementing this technology and adapting this also to the, to the new challenges. For instance, Bühler has, a, has an optical sorting technology that was upgraded also to be able to identify grains that are highly contaminated with the mycotoxin, the most toxic one, which is aflatoxin for, for maize. So it's about also adapting these technologies for the for the new needs that we have. And, and food safety is something that the consumer takes for granted. It's, it's normal. We are all consumers. And um, in the back on the in the in the industry, there's a lot of effort done to make sure that this comes really safe to your plate. Yes. That is, there is something that intrigues me a lot. I mean, um, there is a lot of food waste yeah. right, going on. And in Europe, we waste more food than we import. Yeah. Right? So can you please tell me why? What is going on in this value chain that we waste more food than we import in Europe? Uh, you, you touch, uh, you know, something which is really critical. And I we, we have to differentiate between the losses and the waste. So the losses typically happen in the more upstream side of the value chain. There, it's typically also in the places where this is produced. So if you have, if you don't have proper storage or uh, no proper post-harvest technology, you risk losing it, you know, by insects, uh, or I've talked about mycotoxins or just spoilage of raw material. And then waste is what we do then, you know, as consumers that we don't manage our kitchens well, you know, we buy more food than we need. And uh, that has gone already through the whole processing, demanded quite a lot of resources, energy, and then we waste it. So that is, uh, that is really <laughs> something that, that has to be addressed. So it's a very complex thing, but first, obviously, creating transparency of what is lost and wasted in the industries and in the in, for the different types of, of foods, you know, vegetable and fruit is different than cereals. I think that is the starting point. Also, a lot of effort is done also now today on the consumer side to create awareness. There's a lot of ideas of what you can do with your leftovers. But let's not forget that on the on the upstream sides, especially in, in places where you don't have proper post-harvest technology, there's a big opportunity in really implementing the right technologies to safeguard raw material from the, from the beginning on. And in industrial processes, if you look at the value chains that a company like Bühler touches through the customers, so Bühler is obviously not operating these processing lines, but delivering the technology, and therefore we have insights. Just for the cereal industry, oil, seed, pulses, cocoa, and coffee, there are side streams. So side streams is typically the brand, the hull, the parts which are not used or not edible or are contaminated, which are separated. These side streams amount to 1 billion tons per year. So 
you could think of, you know, what can be done with these raw material <laughs> or, or this side stream maybe as a new raw material. Yes, and this is amazing. One billion ton. This is this is worldwide. Yeah, this is worldwide. And that is mainly okay. You have polysaccharides there. You have uh, proteins. You have a a, a source of uh, different materials, right? You say it. It's a fantastic source of raw material, and we will see. You know, in in the we see it already today, and that is something that will increase the demand for raw material and <laughs> the biomass. This biomass is extremely precious. So exactly. a lot of lignocellulose in there, mm -hmm. um, but there are also other more soluble fibers, which could be interesting for nutrition, as you say, in protein. There are some nasty things that, for instance, for the food industry, you have enzymes or some compounds that taste bitter. You might also have texture issues. Sometimes it's quite hard components if you think of hulls. A lot of this goes into the feed industry. But also the feed industry is stepping up. Obviously, you need to make sure that the animal get the best nutritional value and that you don't feed contaminated material. So at the end, we have this one health concept. So what is, you know, health of animal translates also into health for us humans because we also consume animal-based foods. So I'm not saying that this should not go into the feed industry, but it might need more transformation. Uh, and we can also do other things. Could we use it directly as a food ingredient? For instance, you can, if you think of oil seeds, the vein value in the past has been the oil. The side stream are, is this protein rich fraction, for instance, uh, the, the, the protein cake that as they call it. This can be used as a raw material for plant-based meat, for instance. Yeah. rather than growing new raw material. So that becomes very attractive as also the raw material prices are increasing. And one of the big bottlenecks in delivering enough food for a growing population is land use. We don't have endless land. So being able to produce more food without occupying new land is one of the big challenges. So that's why using all also of these side streams are a big uh, are a big opportunity, and yeah. there yeah. it's also about finding new uses for the industry beyond food. Obviously, uh, you know it's the chemical industry, the plastics, uh, cosmetics. Uh, they are all looking for renewable raw material. Yeah, it is true, and we have technologies like biorefinery technologies that are able to be applied to these side streams and to valorize them. I mean to fractionate because. The critical issue about biomass is the fractionation. Right? You have to be able to fractionate and to valorize different fractions. But one important thing you mentioned is that, I mean, the amount of biomass. In Europe, we have challenges in bio to, 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 to have biomass right? because uh, we, it's not evenly distributed in Europe. So, And the agricultural sector is stronger in the south, but the forest sector is in the north. So it's a very nice opportunity to, to, to get a, a, a better balance of using of a uh, of biomass, right? One important uh, aspect uh, you mentioned in the beginning is about land use, is about water use, and so on. And uh, one thing that calls my attention in in your career is that now you have a very, I mean, I don't know, it is a special position, but I don't see this in many companies today that you are a sustainability uh, officer. Can you tell? us and our um, our uh, community and, and our listeners viewers what is what is what is the job of a of a sustainability officer in a large technology supplier like the company you work for yeah so when i started my career i for sure didn't expect to end up as a, as a sustainability officer probably at that time we didn't even know that there will be sustainability officers <laughs> and yeah. I, as you say, I stepped in into this role, obviously, with a very strong background in my career of food science and technology. So uh, in, in that sense, I did not come into a field which I did not know at all. And 
Now, when I look at my role, especially at the company of, of Bühler, and if we just take the, the aspect of greenhouse gas emissions, a company today has to quantify the emissions that they cause. And you differentiate between the scope one and two. That's the emission that a company like Bühler causes, you know, from the factories, from the use of energy, but also heating the offices or driving around, you know, the service cars. And that for a company like Bühler is around seven, uh, 70,000 tons of CO2. So it's the task to understand these emissions. We also need to understand, you know, the emissions that we create, for instance, from our suppliers by procuring steel or logistics to transport our machines to our customers. And that's around 700,000 tons. But when we look at the use of our sold goods, how our machines are being used, the energy that they need, you know, a mill runs 24 seven, mm -hmm. Uller provides technology around the world. That's millions and millions and millions tons of emissions uh, per year. Our first number, we have an estimation, it's a little bit more than 40 million tons um, of emissions per year. That's, that's around the emissions of Switzerland. So that already tells you where the biggest impact is that we can create. So my task together also with uh, uh, with innovation and uh, with our fantastic portfolios product is making sure that we understand the challenges of our customers in their sustainability journey and support them to reduce their emissions and enable them with new uh, technologies. So in that sense, uh, I... I'm very engaged also on the customer side. Uh, we do life cycle analysis, for instance, understanding the footprint that a customer has, but we also do analysis to understand the footprint of the products. We see today uh, the opportunity to reformulate, for instance, recipes of products, not just in the past, it was more on, on, on the sugar side, on the salt side, Today, the reformulation is done for sustainability. For instance, for a lower CO2 footprint of a product, because the CO2 footprint of a food product largely comes from the CO2 footprint of the raw material. Obviously, processing adds still a bit depending on how much thermal processing you have, but making best use of the raw material. So reducing losses and waste, increasing yield, and, uh, and also choosing smartly the raw materials is a good way, obviously, also to adjust the footprint of, uh, of food products. So in that sense, um, I drive also a very strong uh, customer-facing role in engaging with our customers. And on, yes. uh, on the other side, obviously, we also need to do our homework as a company. <laughs> reduce our own emissions, uh, save energy. Otherwise, we would not be credible. Uh, every player has to do uh, the, the own homework so that we together achieve the big goal of um, addressing climate, the, the climate crisis. Yeah, and I see your, your work is actually, you have to interact with customers, you have to listen, every customer has different needs. And their customers, they, they also have customers that have also different needs. They have to address this uh, uh, needs from the customers. I am a, uh, I am very, we'll see, this is my personal view. I think that we as consumers, we have a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm not saying power, but we can steer a lot to the business too. I mean, if we have choices to more sustainable food solutions, like uh, selecting this, uh, what we eat, uh, controlling waste at home, having different ways of, uh, of uh, even preparing, cooking, and uh, managing our our food. This can have an impact. What is the role also of you and, and relationship with these customers or with the general population? Do you have any any activities going on? Do you monitor these discussions? What is your role in that uh, direction? So obviously, first of all, I'm a, I'm a consumer myself, but we are all different consumers. Um, at Bühler, we are a B2B company, but we need to think B2C. It is through our customers 
customers that we will see you know the needs and requirements on the on the consumer side so we have an in, indirect role but obviously i think creating awareness is something that we can all do from our fields of expertise and everybody touches sustainability from one or the other angle so i'm i'm personally quite engaged when it comes to give also talks um, to, to, to even go to schools to give uh, presentations there and to engage with the community at large. Also here at Bühler, we look at it, you know, what can an individual do? I think this becomes very important because we, we see obviously, especially a, a young generation also sometimes very depressed uh, about the big crisis, climate crisis, nature loss, et cetera. And not everything is under, under, under our control. But understanding what one can do is already a start, you know, for change. Because then everybody can make can make choices. So in that sense, indirectly, we are we are connected also to consumers, although we are not like a directly B two C company. And how do you see, for example, in this effort, the collaboration with research institutions? How do you see the the interaction with those? research institutions, external partners? I think that is key. Uh, you know, Pedro, the challenge is so big. We are facing these three big challenges. It's the climate crisis, loss of nature, and mounting inequalities. And as, 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 as companies, but also as, as societies, we are striving really for the big positive impact. And I think, if you think of, of, of a company like Bühler or other companies, no player can achieve this alone, this big step changes. You need to build alliances. And the interesting thing is that um, sustainability is a strong driver also for new startups to <laughs> come to the scene and, uh, and uh, come with an offering. And they have very interesting value propositions. They might not yet have the experience on, on you know, how to operate lines, food safety operations. That's not their territory. And that's where it might make sense to, to uh, collaborate with established players who uh, know their operations, but you know, are keen to embrace also the new approaches. And then you need always to go back, what is the, the scientific, um, foundation on which we build you know there's so much discussion you know about health about processing about what is good and what is bad and at the end we always have to go down and, and look at the scientific basis because that will also show us the path so in that sense also bringing in academia plays a very important role and also to inspire and i i the next generation, because they will then, at the end, they might, you know, stay in research, but they also change to the private sector. So we have to engage them very early on in their in their studies, and that's also for us a, a very strong reason to to engage with academia. Yes, and this brings me to to our last question. In a, in a sense, uh, what is your when we look at the at the at the young researchers, when you look at the young scientists or people working in company. And, uh, and they will look at, at you, for example, a very successful career. So what will be your recommendations to this, uh, to these young people? I mean, in order to, to succeed so well as you succeeded. Yeah, I, I think every career is, is, is different. And um, I think there are a lot of things. If I look back my career, there are a lot of things that I could not see um, at that early stage, but I knew what was important for me, like in terms of values or in terms of creating impact. And I also encourage people in that sense to look also at the big picture, you know, what do we want to have for the societies? What are the big challenges that we, that we want to address? And I think have this also as a, as a, as a guiding purpose for the career. And 
step up, engage, in fact, and contribute, in fact, for these big goals for, for society. I think that is what young people also are, are, are looking for. And we should give them also the platform, in fact, to do that, to connect the way to, of, of working today is also different. I think also the networks that you can build within companies, the network that you can build also uh, across companies. There are a lot of opportunities that young people should also take as, a, as an opportunity. Do internships, go out and look at, at the world, test things, explore the world. I think that's something that I encourage very much. And you will see at one point, they throw a ball at you. <laughs> you just have to be ready <laughs> to catch this. And, and uh, in that sense, it, it's, it's, not everything in your career you can fully control. Things also can, things, things happen, but be prepared for these next steps. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Beatrice Conde Petit, the winner of Epnoi Technology Award 2023. So we are looking forward to meet you in Graz in September. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you.